Good morning. Good morning. I hope the transmission is coming through loud and clear. Um, I see a number of our students, uh, team members, and guests who have been invited. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for blessing us this morning with your presence. And we are thrilled that you had the opportunity to zoom in. I'm really excited about the lineup for today's presentation. Um, as you recall, we, uh, we, we, we endeavored to give an experience and teach our students last month about the importance of community service and the responsibilities that come with being a good citizen of our community. Uh, I, I recall when I was coming up in school, they had a, had a class called civics, civics. And I'm not sure if they still teach civics in high school, but if they don't, they should be. A lot, of, a lot of courses that they used to teach, like civics and home economics and some of the other um, uh, social sciences, are no longer part of today's curriculum. And that's a shame. But since we'll be talking about the concept of civics and civic responsibility, I want to first give you a working definition of what civics is. And it's very simple. Civics is a social science dealing with the rights and duties of citizens. A social science dealing with the rights and duties of citizens. So what that, what that implies is that each of us who are part of a community, part of a state, part of a, a city, part of a nation, as citizens, we have certain rights, but we also have certain responsibilities that come with our civic duty. Uh, last month, we explored uh, an aspect of civic responsibility by uh, feeding uh, needy members of our community, uh, getting together baskets and delivering them to those less fortunate. Today, we'll explore the other side of civic responsibility that deals with politics and community organizing and, and, and civic engagement uh, from a political standpoint. So I'm pleased to um, welcome our presenters today. We have a a star-studded lineup. We have uh, Pastor Lee May, who is uh, the uh, pastor of Transforming Faith Church. He is former interim CEO from DeKalb County from 2013 to 2016. He's also uh, heading up the organization designed to get out the vote for this uh, hotly contested senatorial race. So in addition to Pastor Lee May, we have uh, Miss Erica Clemens, Dean, who is the organizing director of um, the New Georgia Project. With her is a gentleman named Dwayne Cates, who will be assisting her in their presentation. And lastly, but not certainly not the least of our guests is Mr. Daniel Blackman. He is a candidate for Public Service Commission in District 4. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to get right into uh, today's presentation. Uh, I want uh, you as students to do your best to remain engaged. Uh, this is uh, uh, an important opportunity to gain knowledge 
that helps you, not only helps you, uh, but it also helps the community. If you are a better citizen, you're a better son, you are a better neighbor, and uh, that just doesn't impact your immediate family, but it, it impacts the, your neighborhood, the city, the state, and our nation. So Pastor Lee May uh, came to Atlanta as a 17-year-old teenager. After having lived in seven different cities, he knows that God has called him to serve this community. His life has been an amazing story of God's grace. From CAU to Emory University, where he obtained a master's degree in theology, to launching a business of his own, to being in politics for over 10 years. Uh, life for Pastor Lee has been all, all about service. Uh, Pastor Lee is the former owner of an eight screen movie theater. At age 29, he was the youngest movie theater owner in the nation and only one of three movie theaters owned by an African-American in the nation. So as you can see, not only does he have a distinguished uh, background as a community developer, but he's also a, uh, one of our leading black entrepreneurs. Pastor Lee entered the world of politics by running for the DeKalb County Commission in Georgia. And in 2013, he was appointed to be Chief Executive Officer for DeKalb County. In both positions, he was and still remains the youngest person in either role in the history of the county. He's the son of a retired pastor and has been entrenched in ministry almost his entire life. While a member of one of the largest um, churches in the country, he was ordained as a minister and eventually um, an elder. Although he has pursued many different areas of passion, Pastor Lee knew deep down there was a tug, a pull, a draw to full-time ministry. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the uh, broadcast over to Pastor Lee May. Thank you, uh, Brother Torrance. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me and uh, talking about all my stuff that I've done in the past that I've forgotten about a lot of that stuff. <laughs> but uh, it's truly, truly an honor to be here with you, young men, and for all of the agenda that's coming forward. Y'all, I don't know how much you understand, um, but as uh, Mr. Torrance just, um, just uh, went through the agenda, this is a very powerful agenda that he has put together, that the team has put together for today. So you may not understand it, but uh, many adults will look at it and say, this is really, really good. People who are doing some tremendous things across the state and across the country as well. So, you know, it's an honor to uh, be here. I know I'm not going to be with you a, a whole lot uh, uh, for that long, but I want to also uh, open up uh, allow some time at the very end for any question and answers, uh, if that's okay uh, with you all, because I want to make sure that we engage with one another. So I know this is uh, it's a, a young male initiative. Y'all, I just want to make sure that you are engaged. And so I know not all the, the video screens are on, and that's cool. But if you could, y'all, just put in the chat kind of your ages. I want to know kind of what ages uh, that 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 are on here with me. So I know that y'all know, but put it in the chat so I can see as well. Tell me how old you are and then tell me what school you go to uh, as well. All right, so again, my name is Lee May and uh, I'm a pastor. The name of um, our church is Transforming Faith Church. We started our church about three years ago and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, anybody here from Southwest DeKalb High School but uh, Southwest DeKalb High School is where we have been worshiping before the pandemic. We were worshiping in their auditorium for, uh, for, for some time. So, all right, I see we got Druid Hills and Columbia High School in here as well. Um, and so, yeah, so we've been worshiping at a school and we really developed a really tight-knit relationship with, with Southwest DeKalb 
High School and the other schools around, Rainbow Elementary, Chapel uh, Hill uh, as well. And uh, y'all, I've been in uh, pastoring now for three years, but prior to that, as Mr. Torrance mentioned, I was in politics. I was the uh, chief executive officer of DeKalb County. I was appointed in that role to be in the interim capacity by the governor then uh, of the state of Georgia, who's Nathan Deal. And so I served in that role for longer than I expected. It was for three and a half years. Prior to that, I was a county commissioner uh, and I represented District 5, which is pretty much all of Lithonia, or all of the city of Stonecrest as it is now, some of Stone Mountain and some of Decatur. And, uh, and so in both of those roles, I was the youngest in the history of DeKalb County. And I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying that to say, never let anybody tell you that you are too young to do anything, okay? If you work hard, if you, if you do what you're supposed to do and you study and, and, and you do all the things that you're supposed to, you can accomplish things that maybe other people can't see for you or, or even think that you can accomplish, you can do it. When we uh, opened up our movie theater about 15 years ago, um, again, that was something that people were like, I've never seen an individual own a movie theater before. And, uh, but it's a dream that we had and we were able to accomplish that dream. So y'all, let's talk about um, what the assignment is for me to talk about this morning. Uh, talking about um, this Georgia Congressional Senate uh, uh, runoff election. And, uh, and, and it's very, very important, you all. I know if you've watched any amount of TV, you have seen commercial after commercial after commercial. You've either seen John Ossoff on TV or David Perdue or, or Raphael Warnock or Kelly Loeffler. You've seen them um, almost commercial after commercial because it's a ton of money that has been spent to advertise to get people to vote for them in this election. And uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars is being spent in Georgia because the whole country is looking at this runoff election. So you might, wanna, you might be asking, why is it so important? This is just two US Senate races. And I would also add, there's a third race that's on for public service commissioner and you have one of the candidates that is running for that. He is a phenomenal brother. His name is Daniel Blackman. He'll tell you more about uh, what he's running for. Uh, it will be a historic election with his win. Uh, I love this brother. Uh, you see this t-shirt right here? I'm gonna stand up just a little bit. Clark Atlanta University. That's the best university on the planet. That's my alma mater. That's what brought me to Atlanta, Georgia. I, uh, I, I stepped foot on Clark Atlanta University's campus when I was 17 years old in 1993. Daniel Blackman is a graduate of Clark Atlanta University, so he must be a good brother. Um, but anyway, but these two U.S. Senate seats, are, are, people are paying so much attention to it because uh, of the implications of whoever wins that election. So let's just talk about real quick. I know y'all, uh, Mr. Torrance talked about civics and having a civics class uh, in in the past, uh, and, and I had civics, and I don't know how, what you all, it may just be American government, I don't know what, what kind of classes you all take now. But when I was in school, we learned about the three branches of government, right? Our country has three branches of government. We have the executive, we have the legislative, and we have the judicial branch, right? The president uh, is the executive branch. The president and his, his or, or her, because it will be a her in the future, uh, uh, administration is the executive branch. Now, we have, all, we have different levels of government, too. We have the federal government, the state local government, and the local government. When I was in politics, I was in local government in DeKalb County. And remember, I told you I was a commissioner, and then I told you I was the CEO. Well, as a commissioner, I was in the legislative branch of the county government. And when I was the CEO, I was the, on the executive branch side of the government. And I just wanna let you know that these three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and the judicial, you have that same form at every level of government, at the federal level, at the state level, and at, at the local level. So for the federal level, the United States, president is the executive branch. The uh, judicial branch is all of the courts, the United States Supreme Court, and all of these other courts, federal courts and appeals courts. You don't have to know a whole lot about that right now. Just know 
it's it's they're really really important and they are the ones that that interpret the law and um and actually to some level uh begin to give direction on enforcement of the law then you have the legislative branch and that's why what i really want to hone in on right now and why this u.s senate race is so important uh, in order for our government to really work at its best, all three branches of government really need to be working in harmony, right? They need to work together and, uh, and, and at least talk. They don't always have to agree, but they at least got to be able to sit down and talk and discuss and understand uh, different things that are going on. And so you have the president who has tremendous power, you know, the, the mo one of the most powerful positions on the planet, not just in this country, but on the planet. But in order for the president to, to accomplish uh, many of the things that the president wants to accomplish, the president has to work with the United States Congress. The Congress has two branches, uh, I mean, not two branches, two chambers. You have the upper chamber and the lower chamber. Uh, the lower chamber is the House of Representatives and the upper chamber is the United States Senate. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of this, uh, kind of this political wonkiness in a second. But I just kind of want to um, I want to give you a little bit of an understanding about that so that you can understand why this election is so important. Uh, in order for any law, so the legislative branch is the branch of government that creates the laws. They pass the laws, right? And and it's it's once that happens, it is the executive branch that implements and enforces the law. Okay, and and so uh, if 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 there are certain laws that are created that has to be passed out of both chambers, the, the lower chamber and the upper chamber. They got to agree. And I know I may be losing you a little bit right now, but just hold on tight, just a little bit longer, right? Uh, and they write laws that, um, that affect just every aspect of our life. Have y'all ever seen, um, y'all ever kind of gotten upset about a police involved shooting like a police officer shot a black man a black boy or, or whatever and then nothing happens to that officer you know if you know if it goes to court it doesn't end up well or sometimes it never even goes to court because a police officer is shot an unarmed black person right and i'm just pointing out the police officer and the black person because we've seen that happen too many times well one of the reasons why these officers who are wrong in that shooting, it was a bad shooting, the person was unarmed and all of that. The reason why nothing happens to them in so many cases is because of various laws that are on the books. And, and so uh, you really need to have um, better laws on the books uh, to hold police officers accountable when they are in the wrong. They're not always in the wrong, all police officers are not bad, but when they are in the wrong, there ought to be um, bigger consequences for them. This pandemic right now, right? Um, you know, people can't go to work. People are unemployed. People are hungry. People uh, uh, have uh, challenges with people who are getting sick and all of that and getting kind of the kind of health care um, that they need or whatever. Uh, the United States Senate and the uh, House of Representatives can pass laws, they've been trying to pass laws right now that will help provide some assistance to people who are in need. They write the laws, which um, also includes a lot of money that goes along with these laws. And if they can pass those laws, then the president will sign the laws and then will implement the laws, okay? So you don't have to have to understand a whole lot of the details, I just want you to know this. Just about every aspect of your life, from the kind of schools that you go to, to how affordable schools are, to the kind of health insurance that you're able to afford. Being at being young right now, you don't think about health insurance or health coverage because you're young, you're strong, you don't get sick that much, prayerfully, and all of that. But in, in, in time, you will be thinking about things like these. Your parents and your grandparents, they are really, really concerned about things like, 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 like health care and access to health care. And so who's in the United States Senate is really important. So here's the deal. In order to get anything passed, it's like on your school councils, right? When you vote for your school council president or your SGA 
government or whatever, when you vote for them, um, whoever gets the majority vote wins. That's the same thing with, with laws that are put forward. When somebody writes a law and they put it out for a vote, whoever gets the majority vote, so if I want a, a certain law to pass and I put it forward, whoever votes and if I get the majority votes, uh, just one vote more than, than the other side, then that um, uh, becomes law, right? So that's important. Right now, the United States Senate is, um, it has 100 people in the United States Senate. Uh, and right now, it is 52 to 48. 52 Republicans and 48 um, either Democrats or people who vote like the Democrats vote. These two United States Senate seats could either make the majority of the Republicans bigger or it can, it can break it down to a 50-50 tie, right? Remember, the Democrats have 48 votes. Uh, the, uh, the Republicans have 52. If, you, if, if these two uh, U.S. Senate seats, if the Democrats win, guess what? It'll be a 50-50 tie. Now, why is that big? Because if it's ever a tie uh, for any uh, piece of legislation, particularly that affects us, right? Guess who would get a chance to break the tie? Can anybody guess who, who can break that tie? Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. If, if you can guess who would break that tie. And, uh, and, it's, and I'll give you a hint. It's uh, one of the two people who, who will now be our new leadership uh, in 2021. Who is the tiebreaker in the U.S. Senate? Not the president, not the president. It's somebody that's right next to the president. All right, that, now that should really help you out. Somebody that's right next to the US, to the president. The vice president, there you go, there you go. The vice president, there you go, Hunter. It's the vice president. And guess who's the vice president? It's a black woman. Uh, vice president-elect uh, Kamala Harris. She will be one of the most powerful vice presidents in, the, in modern history of this country because she will be able to break a tie. So now, if there's a U.S. Senator, so Raphael Warnock, and I know this isn't about one side or another, but I know Raphael, he's a pastor uh, in the city of Atlanta. If he wins, and I know the kind of legislation, the kind of laws that he wants to create that benefits people of color, African Americans, and he gets, he, he's able to write some uh, legislation and have them vote on it. And if it ends up being a tie, 50-50, right? Now you have this woman, this black woman, the vice president who can break a tie that can really do things to really help uh, all of our lives, from our healthcare to criminal justice, to, um, to, to, to help in our lives for the pandemic and all of that. So it's important, y'all. A lot of people say that, um, that our vote doesn't count. Not a lot, but too many people. Not enough people actually get out and vote because they don't really believe in this process. And I'm telling you this, it abso absolutely will affect every aspect of your life. And so if you are, set, if you are uh, gonna be 18 by January, I pray that you have registered to vote already. But from here on out, I pray that you will um, vote in these elections. It can be a little bit complicated, but the more, that you engage with our political system, watch the news, read the newspaper, listen to what these candidates and even elected people are saying. If you listen to them, y'all, um, you will understand a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So don't let kind of some of the complexity of things that you are saying stop you from being a part or being engaged, y'all. Really, really be engaged so that you can see what's going on in the U.S. Senate. And encourage those family and friends that you know that are 18 that can vote, encourage them to go vote in this election because the election is on January the 5th and you can begin, people can begin voting already. I'm, I've already completed my ballot. I'm voting by mail because you can do that. And I'm dropping my mail, my, my, um, my vote off in the, in the drop box here today. So I'm gonna stop and uh, answer any questions y'all might have for me. Any questions for me? And you don't have to put it in the chat. You can take yourself off mute and ask it. Good morning, Pastor May. Um, 
I know Dr. Torrance said, that, uh, said earlier that your, your parents were involved in the church. I wanted to ask you that. Do you feel like growing up in the church while you were younger helped you be how successful you are today? Well, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm a uh, what you call a, a PK. I'm a preacher's kid. And uh, and so, yes, absolutely growing up in the church, it helped me to uh, grow in my faith. Uh, I always said when I was a kid, I lived off of my parents' faith. They were Christians, so I was a Christian. But eventually in life, you got to make a decision for yourself. That's in every aspect of your life. So the fact that they were, uh, that I grew up in the church under the, uh, um, it absolutely did help me in doing what I'm doing today in my faith. But also I saw my mother and father, I saw them actively engage in, in civics, in government. I saw them actively engage in what was going on in our community. My dad was a preacher. My mom was a teacher, you know, and I saw their love for people and that just rubbed off on me. I, I absolutely love people. I want to help people as much as I can. Um, I wanted to, I, I, I am writing a couple of things down and I, for, I forgot, but um, could you remind me again what, um, what had to be a tie in order for the vice president to break it? It has to be. So there are 100 uh, members of the United States Senate. And, uh, and, and, and so it has to be a tie is 50 50. If, if all people vote, um, it's 50 50. And then the vice president will step in to break the tie. Okay, thank you. Dr. Dr. Lee, Dr. Uh, uh, Lee, May, uh, this is Pastor Haynes, uh, Haynes Owick, Greater Planning Grove. Hey, Pastor. Uh, I'm so sorry, I got in, come in a little late, but can you can you touch as part of the uh, the, the program? Uh, uh, I thought it may be good for you to also touch briefly on the difference between the electoral votes and popular votes. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people don't understand why, you know, the difference. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so let me say this. Um, it, it, it can be a, a bit complicated. You know, I'm going to just start off with that. But don't let the complication kind of stop you from voting. When you are voting for the president, you're actually voting um, to, uh, 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 you're not voting directly for the president. You're voting to have electors um, vote for the president. So your vote, although you are voting for the candidate that you want, your vote is actually going to um, select the electors to vote for the candidate that you want. So the popular vote in every state, the popular vote is the total number of votes that were cast, right? So if a million people voted and 500,000 plus one uh, voted for a certain candidate. Now that uh, whoever got the majority vote, even if it was just one vote more, uh, whatever candidate got the majority vote, there is now a group of electors that will from the state. And uh, and so it's it's a bit complicated. Personally, I don't like it, but it's the system that we have. And one of the reasons I don't like it is because it's directly connected to slavery and how you uh, and how you count uh, African Americans proportionally uh, throughout our state. So that always kind of makes me feel some kind of way when I think about it. But it's the system that we have, and so you have to understand the system. Even if the system isn't fair, or you don't think it's fair, or you don't like it, you still have to operate according to that system to accomplish the end result of what you want to see. And the end result of what we want to see is good government that reflects who we are. It, and is it the legis legislative branch that can change that system eventually, if need be? Absolutely. Remember, the legislative branch is the one who creates laws. And they can change laws as well. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, the legislative branch can change the way this system uh, is run in terms of how we select our president. It's been like that since the founding of our, our of our nation, uh, and um, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Uh, Jesse Dansby here. Uh, what uh, specifically can young people who not a, not at the age to vote? What specifically? What specific action could they take uh, to support the system, or what action can they take? 
uh, to uh, get involved in this process. If they're too young to vote? If they're too young to vote and they I, want to be a messenger, what can you yeah. do what you guys for bettering? What, what, could, what, could, what could they do? Let me tell you, this is what you can do right now. So you can't vote if you're not 18, if you haven't registered and, you, and you're not 18 yet, uh, this is what you can do. If you really, really believe in making sure that people can get out the vote, let me tell you, if you get, if you have a cell phone, I would tell you to text everybody that you know that is over 18 and say, please, for me, please vote uh, on January the 5th for this runoff election. I'm telling you, that will make a world of difference because number one, it's going to make them feel bad if, if they don't go vote and they know that a young person asked them to vote. You know, make sure, ask every adult that you know that you come across, hey, are you going to vote on January the 5th? Okay. And, and, and if, if they say no, just say, well, can you at least do it for me? If you don't do it for yourself, do it for me. I'm telling you all, all your family members, you know, um, your, uh, uh, other adults that you may encounter, ask your teachers. <laughs> you know, ask your principal, ask every adult that you can. I'm telling you, it will really make a difference in terms of people uh, getting out the vote. What? Absolutely. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Dancy. Go ahead, sir. Uh, what message do you have to those people who might tell that young person, well, my vote doesn't count anyway. Why should I do it? It's rigged. You know where I'm coming from here. Yeah. I tell sometimes. It's very confusing. Yeah, well, I would say um, you definitely will never make a change if you don't get involved. And so there will never be a change if you don't vote. Um, I'll give a good example. The city of Lithonia uh, is a, although a lot, there's a lot of, uh, a, the city of uh, Lithonia has a mayor. And I remember one election, the mayor won with 10 votes. Mm. 10 votes. And so just think about that. That's, you know, my, there are more than 10 houses on my street. You know, if, 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 if one street could have voted more who didn't, it could have been a new mayor. And so for those people who liked or didn't like the mayor, if they didn't like the mayor and they didn't vote, I say it's on you because you could have made a different decision uh, with that. Uh, every election is, is super, super close. This election uh, for president, was ridiculously close in Georgia. Joe Biden won Georgia by like 12,000 votes, you all, out of uh, how many people live in Georgia now? Like almost 9 million people or so. And I think, what, about 5 million people voted. And so when you think about that, um, that's not a lot of votes. Every vote does count and you can make a difference. Pastor Lee, this is Robert Stevens. Do you have a preference with absentee ballots or voting in person? And explain the difference for our scholars. So you have, there's really three ways that you can vote in any election in Georgia. Well, and it's really across the country as well. You can vote by mail. You can vote early in person um, at, at, at some early polling places around your county. That's before election day. Uh, or you can vote on election day in person. Uh, so all three of them are safe, secure, and viable ways to vote. So I don't have a challenge with any of them, but all of them have different uh, rules re uh, related to them, different timing and things like that. Uh, up until um, uh, our, our primary election, which was in July, I had always, always voted in person, either on election day or early, uh, or, or early before election day. Um, but j in July, for the primary election, I voted by mail. And in November, I voted by mail. And, and I took it, and once they, I, I requested my absentee ballot online. They mailed me my ballot. I completed it. I pulled it back, put it back in an envelope that came with the ballot. And then I took it and dropped it at many of the absentee ballot drop-off locations in the cab. So one... They had a bunch of them, and I just went to one and dropped it in the box. It looked like a post office box, but it wasn't. It was a county control one. I didn't put it in the mail because I wanted it to go directly to our elections office. I think all of them are good. I, I, like I said, I, I voted uh, by absentee ballot for this January election um, as well, and, uh, and I believe in it, especially because we're in the middle of a pandemic.
They're all safe, secure, and good ways to do it. What would you tell to a young person that wants to get involved in politics but doesn't know where to start or where to go to get involved? Okay, you were kind of breaking up there. I, I, I was, I think the question was, what would I say to a young person who wants to get involved in politics but doesn't know how? Yep, yes. Doesn't know where to start. Yes, sir. But know where to start. Hey, look, start right where you are. I, I tell everybody that, whether they're young or old mm -hmm. or whatever. If you want to get involved in politics, start where you are. So think about where you are. How old are you, Hunter? 15, sir. 15. Start where you are. Where do you spend the majority of your time uh, not at home? Where do you spend the majority of your time? YMCA. Where? YMCA. At the YMCA. Okay. So between the YMCA and school, right? That's, that's where you spend the majority of your time. Those are two areas that you can get involved, and it's really about leadership. So um, getting involved in politics is really about leadership. So at school, there are clubs. There's student government. Um, there are uh, all kinds of groups and things. Find where your passion is and get involved in that area to serve and then ultimately lead. At the YMCA, there may be volunteer opportunities there and, and other groups and things there. Find your opportunities, serve, and lead. If you play sports, um, make sure that you're leading by example. You're working hard as anybody else, that you're training, that you're, follow, that you're studying where you need to, and be in a role of, of leadership. Serving is all about, you know, uh, uh, leadership. You know, leadership is all about serving. It goes both ways. And, uh, and so find those opportunities where you can serve in those places that you show up all the time. And then figure out ways that you can do things to help out your community. Maybe you can do like a community cleanup or some kind of um, thing to help other people in need, a food giveaway, you know, clothing giveaway or something. These are things that you can do right now. You just get an adult to say, hey, can you help me with this? This is something I want to do and get some of your other friends and school classmates and things like that. Those things will begin to help you get involved in, in the civic process without ever having run for a political office. It will prepare you. Uh, along the way. Very good, very good. Thank you for that uh, uh, question, uh, Hunter. Uh, and I just want to make a, a quick comment. And I know uh, Pastor May's time is limited, but uh, more and more, especially locally, we're seeing Black women uh, uh, locally and nationally assume and, and win um, uh, political elections. And uh, it, it's almost getting to the point where uh, our black men, you rarely see them running. And so I want to encourage, since this is a male youth initiative, I want to encourage our young men to consider politics. Yeah. We can't leave the, the, uh, the political arena up to our women. I mean, it's great that they're involved, but it's almost like that our men have, have taken a back seat. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's willingly or unwittingly, but, uh, but, but we as men have to step up and assume the mantle of leadership uh, more and more. So I applaud you uh, for that question. Uh, right now, there are only, and uh, talking about the senatorial race, there are 100 senators, two for each state. That's 100. And there are only three out of 100, correct me if I'm wrong, Put that a black, one female, Kamala Harris, and uh, Tim Scott, who's Republican, and um, Cory Booker, who's a Democrat. Three out of 100. Uh, that's, a, that's woefully inadequate for our interests to be represented. So we need young men to take an interest in politics uh, and, and run, and, and not just run to, to win, but run to, to get in there and make a difference. Too often, uh, we give our votes to, to, to candidates who get in there and we don't hear anything else about them. That's right. You know, uh, as far as representing our interests. And so we need a, a new generation of young black leaders that will get in there and actually work to benefit the community, not for fame, glory, money, or any of those other things. Because our community bear, uh, uh, seriously and critically needs that type of leadership. 
Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, okay. thank you for having me. I, I think that is a perfect kind of segue uh, as we about to leave up, well, as I'm about to leave out of here. Uh, if you just take the population of the African American community in this country, we should have at least 13 U.S. senators. Amen. You know, Absolutely. so this, is, this isn't just about having black folk for black folk's sake. This country is a better country when it really reflects who this nation is, you know, and this is a diverse country now, you know, and so it also reflects that. So we got a long way to go. And, uh, and so that's why, you know, if you, if you want to see this um, nation, the, the political leadership reflect this nation, you got to get involved. You got to, you got to vote. You know, when you have a viable uh, black candidate on the ballot, we better vote or, or never talk about the fact that this country, the leadership doesn't reflect our people. But you were part of it not reflecting our leadership if you don't vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for having me. Pastor, and, um, and uh, thank you for responding on such short notice. Oh, no problem. You, you filled in a gap that was, uh, that was uh, sorely needed. Thank so uh, we'll be in touch, and uh, God bless you and your get-out-the-vote efforts. God bless you. Take care now. All right. Bye-bye. This is Absolutely. Mr. Dwayne Cates. He was born in a small town in, in Arkansas. Woo, 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 woo. Little Rock is my, is my <laughs> hometown. His parents oh, okay. related to move uh, his family to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Moving to Georgia for school helped expose Dwayne to what a difference it made to have the right leadership in local elected seats. Although excited about his new home, he could not help but wonder why or how his previous city, Milwaukee, did not get it right. He then learned how important it is to vote and have the right leaders representing the people. Now he spends his days organizing and campaigning on the behalf of voter education in hopes of turning out elections. So we are thrilled to have you. Um, Dwayne, and if you would uh, uh, share with our audience and our students a little bit about what you do and, and tell us more about the Georgia product project and how it absolutely. helps. Absolutely. So absolutely. So New Georgia Project um, is a voter registration focused organization. Um, we typically get into the community and teach voter education, voter suppression, voter awareness, advocate. Um, you know, try to make people become more advocates, engage more. We try to turn activists out of uh, the people we communicate with on a daily basis. So New Georgia Project is really something, I would say, progressive and innovative in the sense of what it's doing for the community of Atlanta and Georgia. So, and, um, you were speaking on Stacey Abrams. She, she was a part of, she did start it, and she was a part of the founders, and um, she went on to start Fair Fight. So I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar with Fair Fight, but Stacey Abrams is um, definitely a part of Fair Fight. So VIBE is the voting initiative for Brothers Engagement. Um, is everyone seeing it okay? If you can't, just give me a shout and let me know. Everything right, looks so fine. Our... Yeah, everything looks fine. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. So our mission is the voting initiative of Brothers Engagement. We uh, seek to inspire Black men to vote and become more civically engaged in their communities. Because we know that black men play an important role in today's political process. Vibe aims to have meaningful dialogue that seeks to educate them on the value of being politically active. And I know this sounds wordy, but it's exactly what we, what um, Pastor was just doing with you guys and explaining voter education thoroughly and just really connecting you to the direct vote is what we try to do because we know it can be overwhelming, especially if you don't really have a sense of education on voter education. So um, what is voting rights exactly? So um, we all know that in 1965, um, a law outlawed discriminatory, discriminatory voting practices that were adopted in most Southern states. Now, um, those discriminatory practices were things like, if you couldn't read, they won't allow you to vote. Just pretty much any thing they could think of to stop us from voting and back then we we were fighting to that to get that vote to get that right to vote we literally um it's a whole story uh we went through the whole civil war just to gain these rights so that's we it's really important this is just giving you a history of where it's coming from so 
Now that we have the right to vote, why actually use this vote? This is the question I get the most amongst all of my young black males out here because we we just don't have the education of it. Like um, like Ken was saying earlier, you know, we used to have civic class when I was young and we no longer have it. So it's like, where would they gain this education from? So um, why vote? It's because it affects everything, literally every single thing that you're doing. Um, it affects what's, how your schools are set up, whether, whether your school is going to have a cafeteria serving government lunch or is going to have a Taco Bell inside. And that's literally a, a thing. There's some schools out here with restaurants inside it. And that's just something we wouldn't know because we don't vote in favor for our schools to achieve those type of things. Um, laws and equality, parks and infrastructure, jobs and entrepreneurship. It affects all of these things, and that's why it's super important to get out here and vote. Now, um, you're probably wondering how does it how does it directly connect to those things? How does it directly affect these things? So we're about to get into it, y'all. So, how does my vote count when an electoral college has the final say? I think I just heard somebody ask this question to the pastor. So, um, the Constitution states that the president and the vice president of the United States are to be chosen every four years, which we all know, but by a small group of people, which we all don't know. And these small group of people are 538 people who are individually referred to as presidential electors, but as a collective are referred to as the electoral college. Now, these are the people who elect the president, as the pastor was saying. Um, we elect these 538 people though, and that's that's where our knowledge kind of falls off because everyone shows up for the presidential election. But, you know, when there's the side elections for Senate, when there's those side elections for districts, we are, really aren't paying too much attention to it. Like he said, someone won with 10 votes. And that's that's just insane. You know, that means a classroom could have stopped that man from becoming mayor. And that's just how that's how unaware we are of those elections and how important they are. So these 538 people, they're made up of 435 representatives from the 50 states. So what that means is throughout the 50 states, they are all broken down into small districts. And everyone who leads a district has a electoral vote. So um, it's 530, it's 435 of those people. Now we also have 100 senators and um, each state has two senators, as explained earlier. And um, so now we're gonna give you the breakdown of how that all comes into play. So we have three branches of government. We have the legislative, which is the one we're directly connected to, and I'll show you why. And we have the executive branch, which is the president, the vice president, and whoever they choose to have in their cabinet. And then we have the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court, and other federal courts making decisions nationally. So when we're getting started, we're gonna just jump into the legislative. When you think of legislative, think of legal. So legislative, legal, because these are the people who make the laws. So a lot of the times I hear a lot of my black brothers complaining about um, you know, the unequal justice that we, we definitely face in this country. So we have to know that that system was built to do that. But in order to change that system, we would have to change the laws. So how do we change the laws? We would have to have people in Congress that represents our needs, our desires. So we would have to vote these people in Congress. Um, Congress broken down is makes up of a Senate and a House of Representatives that we were speaking about earlier. Each state has two Senates and the House of Representatives are just based on how many districts are in each state. So um, the legislative branch has 435 members from the House of Representatives and 100 members from Senate. And Georgia has 14 of those 435 members, meaning that Georgia has 14 districts. Now, if you aren't familiar, I'm gonna to try to make this very fun and easy to um, grasp because once I'm done with this presentation, I want y'all to walk out and just try to scream, go vote on the mountaintop. Um, so if you look at Georgia, we have 14 districts and the main one is Atlanta because this is the capital, right? So if you look at Atlanta, it's mainly district five. So district five is, is most of Atlanta. So 
who runs District 5? I don't know if anyone on this call knows. If you know, you can just yell it out or put it in the chat real quick. But um, who, who knows who was in charge of District 5 for the past 20 years at least? It was John, it was John Lewis. Um, he was Georgia's fifth district. He represented it. Um, John Lewis held this district from January 3rd of 1987 all the way to July of 20, July 17th of 2020 when he passed away. Rest in peace, John Lewis. Um, this just show this just goes to show you how important the vote is. We voted so much for John Lewis and showed up so much for John Lewis that in 1996 he ran unopposed, meaning nobody even contested him. Nobody, nobody wanted to be opposite of him. Nobody wanted to try to run against him. I think and it's because of that vote. When that vote is that strong, that's the power that we have to will. This man was in his position for all of those years and was able to make an electoral vote on behalf of Atlanta. So um, when we're voting the right people in, we can get the right laws passed. So let me show you what John Lewis vote counted towards. I know this screen is very small and hard to read, so I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. These are just some of the things that John Lewis voted towards. He, he used his electoral vote towards these things. Um, and just to give you a, a sum up, most of the electoral vote in the state goes to, so the majority vote is what represents Georgia. And Georgia's blue because the majority of our electoral votes were blue. So if you look at this screen, you see exactly what John Lewis represented, what he was voting for. Now you very well have, very well much have candidates who did not vote in favor of these things. And a lot of those candidates are who are running the country and are most of those electoral votes. So we, we need more John Lewis's with electoral votes. We need more Cory Booker's. We need more Kamala Harris's. We need more, more people progressive in the movement. So how do we do that? We vote, you guys. We have to vote, vote, vote. So voting your district is so important, so important. Know who is running your district. Know who is leading your district. Because the person who's leading your district probably won with 10 votes. You would never know if you're not paying attention. And if they won with 10 votes, you and your friends could knock them out and you could become the mayor. And it's that simple. You don't have to have some type of big, huge political background. You just have to want to do the right thing and have the right people on your team to back you up to make it happen. And if you have that, you could definitely win an election. It's that simple. Voting is everything. Um, so the next branch would be the executive branch, which is the presidency and the vice president and everyone they hire. Now, who elects them? The previous branch elects them, which is the legislative branch. And now if we can devote a whole bunch of John Lewis's into office, that means we can get all of these John Lewis's to vote a John Lewis for president. And it's that simple. We could literally control everything with a vote. We just have to make sure we're using that vote. So um, people ask all the time when I'm out here, especially my young black brothers, why didn't Obama do more? Why didn't Obama help black people? Why, 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 why? We have to know what role Obama actually was in. He was the, actual, he was the president of the United States. And the Constitution says that the United States must have a president and vice president. And these two people and the people who work for them belong to the executive branch of the federal government, meaning it's the duty of them to run the federal government and to see that all the laws and nations are carried out. So all the laws in the nation are carried out. So what that means is the laws that are in place, the president are making sure that these laws are being carried out throughout the nation and they're taking care of taxes and the national debt and things of this nature. This is why the president is in place. But if you come up to Obama and you say, hey, Obama, you need to pass a law to make police brutality stop. He don't have that power at all. We know who have that power the legislative branch. If we can get a whole bunch of people voted into our districts that represent what we want, we will get it. And it's very simple, just like that. And the president is the highest representative of the people of our nation, meaning he goes to other countries in representation of the nation. He's not, he's not the person who can decide and 
decide everything of the nation. He's just the person who represents the nation. So we vote the laws into the legislative branch. They pass it to the president and the president represents these laws for us as a whole. He's the poster boy for what we did on the ground. So three branches of government. Um, continuing. So um, we're going to continue the executive branch and the president. So like I said, he represents our country in discussions with other nations, meaning if he goes to Asia, he's talking trade deals. He's talking trade deals on the behalf of the whole country. He's not just talking trade deals on behalf of Georgia or on the behalf of Kentucky. He's talking on the whole country. So the president, I, is never zoomed in to one state or shouldn't be outside. Um, it should not be zoomed in to just one specific state because he represents us as a whole. So when one state is struggling and has issues in that state, it's easy for the people to scream at the president, hey, fix this right now. But you have to yell at everybody who comes before the president, like your district leaders, your senates, house representatives, and things of that nature. Um, the best way to get them out is to vote them out, you guys. We can scream all day. We can scream at them. And, um, but if we're not going to vote behind the screaming, we, we're, we're just like wasting our energy. We have to go scream from the mountaintop and then we have to go vote. Screaming from the mountaintop lets people who don't hear or see the frequency of everything going on, it lets them pick up on everything. So we definitely have to continue to scream, but also vote. Use your voice and use your vote. They're both important. They're both equal. Um, the last branch would be the judicial branch, um, which is the Supreme Court and other federal court. Now, who chooses this? The president. And this is super important because if we've been paying attention, Donald Trump actually just filled the seat in the Supreme Court. Now, um, why this is important, those seats are filled, and once they're filled, they have that seat for the rest of their life. So if they're filling those seats with people who really don't favor us and have our best interest, we're going to be spending a very long time dealing with those people. So if we can get a president who represents what we represent into office, then that president could potentially put someone in the Supreme Court who represents what we represent. And like I said, it's that easy. Um, so the judicial branch interprets the meaning of law. It applies the laws to individual cases and decides if laws violate constitution. It is compromised of the Supreme Court and other federal courts. And what this means to break this down, the judicial branch interprets the meaning of laws. So if legislative branch passes a law stating that no one can come out their house past eight o'clock anymore, we pass it to the president, the president signs it. The Supreme Court is the only person that has the power to say, okay, no one can come out the house except, except they get, to, they get to change the law. They get to go into detail. They get to specify the law. They get to interpret the meaning of the law. They get to apply laws to individual cases like Roe versus Wade and things of that nature. Um, so. The judicial branch are the, is the branch that decides if the law violates the Constitution or not, if this is a law that should stay or is this a law that should go. If this law compromises the Constitution, it's out of there. The Supreme Court is who would make that decision. So in Georgia right now, Cobb County, Georgia election officials plan to slash the number of early voting locations from 11 to 5 for the upcoming runoff election. Now, this move will harm Black and Latino ex-voters as, uh, as many of these polling places serve communities of color. Now, what does this mean? They are making it very hard for us to vote because they know a lot of people aren't really aware of how important their vote is. So when you put a long line in front of them, it's easy for them to say, you know what, it's only one vote, I'm going to go home hop out of that line but if enough people do that that can definitely swing the election in an unfavorable way so they're definitely trying to suppress the vote and change the outcome of the vote by doing this and things like this go on all the time and we were speaking about Stacey Abrams earlier you see she's the one that retweeted this from Fair Fight and she's saying that it's unacceptable that Cobb County's 
Georgia's third largest and already the site of the longest early voting lines in two, of 2018 and 2020 will close more than half of its early voting locations for its January 5th runoff. That's on purpose. And we have to be aware of who's in charge of those type of decisions. And we have to be voting those people out to vote in the people who's going to make the right decision. This is the type of stuff that happens when the wrong people are in office. So we must vote, 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 vote. You can vote locally for the best district leaders like John Lewis, and that way they can vote for the best presidential candidate like a John Lewis, and he could be president, and then the president can appoint a Supreme Court, the best judge and leaders to write our laws. And that's exactly how it works, you guys. So um, now I want to get into any questions. I know I just like said a whole bunch of information. I'll go back to anything that you need me to. But um, yeah, so go ahead, chime in. Uh, let me let me just um, get the ball rolling, uh, Dwayne. That was an excellent presentation. You know, we were talking about civics class earlier and the lack of uh, it being offered. We just got one, <laughs> and, and I don't know why. I don't know why uh, Miss Dean wasn't able to um, attend or zoom in with us, but we got the right one. I was very, very impressed with that presentation. Did you, thoroughly knowledgeable, thoroughly knowledgeable about the content um, and presented from uh, a young person's perspective, uh, easy to understand, excellent job. Did you put that together or you just? Yeah, I, yeah, I put that together, I put that together. Um, actually, when I'm out here organizing, all I'm thinking about, because four years ago, I was literally, that person saying my vote doesn't matter, my vote doesn't count, forget this, forget that. So I know exactly what they're thinking about when they're thinking about it. I know exactly what they're feeling. Usually it's because we're going through a hard time in life and we're connecting the vote to that. And we're saying I'm voting, but look how I'm living. And um, mm. it's, just, it's just way, it's way more wow. simple than that, you know? So. Wow. <laughs> hey, that sums it up, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we've been voting. I mean, your sentiments, I think, um, encapsulate the sentiments of, of, of many of many of our people. Um, what has our vote gotten us in 50 years, including myself? Exactly. And, uh, of course, uh, we have to have an answer. We have to have mm -hmm. an answer for, for our people when, when that question is raised because it's, fr it's frustrating even for me, you know, and, and I know that um, uh, that we have to do something different, but not voting is not the answer, but accountability, electability is not accountability. But anyway, um, um, what about some questions from, uh, from students? Anybody have a, a question for Dwayne um, or, or students or, or anyone, anyone? Yeah, anyone, just go ahead and chime in y'all. Well, I've got, a, I've got, this is Dan, I've got a question, and this is kind of dealing with strategies for the local election, uh, mm -hmm. central election. Uh, what in strategies are you employing that's different than the traditional, you know, young man, young people come with all kinds of strategies. For instance, uh, I think someone was dealing with, uh, I mentioned someone who mentioned that since the November election, there's been X amount of people that have become of age to vote. Is there a strategy to kind of go out and get those people? Because I think sometimes that those groups are kind of overlooked, particularly for this senatorial election. Are you employing strategies like that? I'm, I guess I'm looking for different strategies for different groups of folks. And I think you are on the, on the leading edge of doing that. So can you share with us maybe some of those things that you're doing that's, that's not the norm? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of you know that we have a software called NGP Van. And um, what that does is it allows us to break data down. So um, what I mean is I could literally grab a list of Republican voters from the age of 40 through 60 and just block them out and only only knock on doors of Democrats. So that's helped us um, be able to reach the correct conversations with the right people. But um, usually we're just trying to hop out here and just relate to people on a real level and not, not not really a PC level all the time. Um, 
we're not we're not coming out here and you know just saying hey vote 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 we're like hey why don't you vote what's the real reason you know like break it down to me mm -hmm. and then when you break it down to me i'm going to show you how voting could have changed that and you're going to be like wow you know a lot of the times like like i love that the pastor has said that that mayor won with 10 votes i love that because it happens more than we think it happens and um, if we could gather just our church to just say hey go vote for brother hines he would be the mayor. It, it would be that simple. And it's just, we just don't realize it's that simple. So I usually just try to connect the vote to people's personal lives. That's usually my go-to strategy. Excellent. Anybody else? Good morning, Mr. Cage. Um, I was wondering, um, what made you get involved with the photo suppression and, and the fight to get, um, to, what, to educate people on voting? Did you hear okay. the question, Dwayne? You speak up a little louder, um, Hunter. I was asking what made him get um, um, get involved with the, uh, educating black people on getting the vote in and the importance of voting. What What made you okay. get involved, Dwayne? So yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I'm, I'm from Milwaukee. It, if you know anything about Milwaukee, it's it's really it's really segregated. Like it's really segregated. Um, and so you get used to it if you're from there, you don't know any better. So um, when I moved for college, I came to Georgia and I just seen a whole different world. I seen a mansion and then right next to it, I see like a shack and I'm just like, what? Like, it's, it's, it's just such a different place. So um, I had to learn why is it that way? How is it that way? Why aren't, you know, is why why isn't it as segregated as where I come from? Why don't um, the people worry about police officers here like they do where I'm from, like where I'm from, if a police officer is on the same street as you, you can almost guarantee that you can pull it over. It's literally that serious up there. Mm -hmm. um, so then when you're down here and you see a police driver next to you, you kind of like stiffen up because that's what I'm used to. And you, you wonder why he didn't pull you over and you see all of these different changes and that's what I saw. And um, I'm seeing that whenever I would go home to visit, I would see the mindset that everyone would still be in that place because they, they weren't able to come to Georgia and see something different. So they would still be in that mindset. So I would just know, I would have to teach them like, hey, you guys know if we would just vote that person out, it could be that simple, you know, things of that nature. And it's like, all right, I want to become a part of the push to teach and educate and provide that knowledge to people who were once like me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Excellent observation. Um, let me, let me um, piggyback on that and say, um, it a lot your experience or the difference of experience from Milwaukee and Atlanta. Uh, you you drew a stark contrast. One place, Milwaukee, you're automatically going to get pulled over, and then you come to Atlanta, and you expect that, but you don't. Mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with where you are in Atlanta. Now, Fulton County is mostly black. And there are a lot of black, you know, um, administrators, uh, you know, uh, policemen, so forth and so on. Um, but you go out to you go out to some of these other counties, and I think your experience, that you would agree, would be much different. Um, out in Gwinnett, mm -hmm, out in Gwinnett, uh, totally different, you know. Uh, some of these other counties, even yeah. Cobb, they use they say Cobb count on being busted. Some sure some of you have heard that. Mm -hmm. And things have changed to a degree because more and more of our people are moving into or populating these areas. Mm -hmm. But there's still some areas in Georgia now you don't you don't want to see a cop with with uh, with black absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So, and I agree with that. And um, that was a perfect statement because, um, like you said, people started to move to those areas and change this and that's just something that we we haven't picked up on in milwaukee if you go to milwaukee the north side is going to be full of black people the west side is going to be full of asians the south side is going to be full of latinos and mexicans and latina x and the east side is going to be full of all jewish rich mansions and the lakefront and it's literally that way it's not a mix up it's no black people going to move to this area if you move to that area, it becomes an issue. It's it's really different up there. So when I come down here and I do see that happening, I see I do see things like Cobb County being way more 
different from Atlanta. And, you know, the further you go from Atlanta, the more it becomes closer to Milwaukee. So uh, I do see that, but I see moving into those areas is what's changing it. So, you know, me getting out here and telling people, hey, I see this. Maybe this is what we should do. Maybe we should move into these areas. Maybe we should use our vote when we get into these areas. I know you only have an apartment in this area in Buckhead, but maybe you should use that vote, you know, to change up the district leader who runs this area. You know, maybe you could gather you and the rest of your black friends in Buckhead to change the district leader. It's literally that simple because these people are winning these elections, y'all, with no, with no like, combativeness at all. Excellent. And I see y'all in the chat. I'm definitely going to get y'all that presentation. Thank y'all for all the stops, for real. Okay. Thank you for being with us. Uh, you, were, you blessed us today. And um, mm -hmm. keep up the good work. And like I said, I'm going to follow up with you. I'm, I'm very impressed uh, with what you're doing and uh, your passion uh, for uh, civic engagement. Uh, we need more, we need more really young mean. men like you. Absolutely. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So um, if there aren't any more questions for Dwayne, we will move right along into the next segment. Hello? Uh, this is Michael. Uh, and, uh, I just wanted to say I'm going to email Kenneth that presentation. And Kenneth, could you get that out to I will. Wants I will. To? Absolutely. 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 Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Mike Cross, I have a quick question for Dwayne. Um, first, great comment about the mayor with the 10 votes. And I want to uh, kind of move that into the local elections. I, I think um, some of the things we kind of miss out to on, are on the local elections. Um, do you guys have any plans to get out the vote for the upcoming local elections? Because they're very important because they actually help them. Between that and the census, they help them draw our districts. And we can help get rid of gerrymandering if we do the right thing. No, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm working on right now. I don't know if a few of you probably heard, like, in the beginning of the call, a few people came in. That was like canvassers getting ready to go out in Clayton County and push get out to vote. So right now, we're just trying to get out into the neighborhoods who really aren't turning their elections out as much as we would like them to. And we're just trying to bang on their door and let them know, like, this time you need to get out to vote. If you never got out to vote ever, this will be the time. So before this, we were focused on voter registration. But we know the uh, um, voter registration deadline to vote in this next election was December 7th. So right now we're just focused on making a plan to vote because we have early elections coming up. And it's so simple to vote early. It's as simple as on your way home, seeing their vote early sign and stopping there, basically get that vote put through. So we're just trying to push people to go make a plan and know that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, let's uh let's let's pivot here and move right along. Our next um presenter is a man named Daniel Blackman. And he is act, act actually a candidate right now. So uh let me tell you a little bit about uh Mr. Blackman. He's, his, his candidacy is for Public Service Commission District 4. Daniel Blackman was born into a military family in Columbus, Georgia. He is the child of immigrants, the son of an U.S. Army Ranger, and the grandson of an ambassador to the United Nations from Barbados. Interesting. Daniel he benefited from this through exposure to other cultures and regions throughout his childhood. A Clark Atlanta University alumni, Daniel has been advocating on behalf of disenfranchised communities for over 20 years. While working in Atlanta's burgeoning music scene in the 1990s, interesting, his mentors, Reverend Joseph Lowry, Doctor, we all have heard that name, a legend in it from Atlanta, a pastor and community rights activist, Joseph Lowry, Dr. Gerald Durley, Reverend James Orange, and the Reverend C.T. Vivian. 
uh, also an Atlanta legend of the civil rights movement, pushed him into activism. First and foremost, I want to thank you all for the opportunity. I'm going to turn my camera on. I'm uh, in between cities. Okay, here we go. So I want to first thank you all. For those that don't know, my name is Daniel Blackman. I'm running for the Public Service Commission in the state of Georgia. Um, I'm a part of the runoff, and I'm very honored to be here. I think this conversation for our community, for our youth, for so many people um, is of the utmost importance. Um, the reason why I think this race is so consequential, especially with the two U.S. Senate races that we know are of the utmost importance, is because this race specifically deals with pocketbook issues. Uh, Georgia has the fifth highest electric rates in the United States, and we have the eighth highest overall utilities in the United States. What that means is, on average in the U.S., 5% uh, of a person's paycheck goes towards their utility bill. In Georgia, 18% of our paycheck goes to for our utility bill, which is not only an a, a egregious number, but we understand fundamentally why there are so many families and counties and communities that struggle. Uh, a parent's income should never determine their children's outcome. But too often in Georgia, around our state, we're seeing so many counties be left behind. Um, I am the son of immigrants. My father was a United States Army Ranger. I grew up in Columbus, Georgia. I was recruited to go to Clark Atlanta University. My wife go, went to Spelman College. So I have roots in this state that I have you know, really grown over the last 32 years. And I'm very appreciative of the space I'm in, but I don't take it for granted. Uh, we have so many opportunities with this election to target our youth, to target our men. Uh, one of the things that we're doing uh, when I was uh, three, I'm sorry, uh, six years ago, um, I had an opportunity to work on three separate White House initiatives. Um, one of them was the My Brother's Keeper initiative under the Obama administration. And we worked because black male achievement was so low within our colleges and black male voter turnout was equally low. Um, I have taken it upon myself over the last several years to focus in on increasing those numbers, not just for our electorate, but in the energy sector, in the environmental space, in so many areas that offer opportunities for our, for our communities to be able to thrive. Outside of the high utility rates or public health issues, uh, our children get asthma three times the national rate. Um, I have a child right now. He's 16 years old. He's a standout track and football athlete. But unfortunately, there's an emergency inhaler. Um, that my son has to have on the sideline every single day um, that he competes. And it's because of the air quality and the water quality in the state of Georgia. Um, we're the number one importer of coal. We're the number one exporter of coal. When it comes to water contamination, 12 of the United States' dirtiest rivers are in the state of Georgia, including the Savannah River and the Chattahoochee. So I want us to understand, one, the importance of a position like the Public Service Commission and the fact that in the 140 year history of this commission, we've never had an African American that's been elected to this position. I also want people to understand the importance of why energy and the environment are critical to the future of our schools, our churches, our communities, HBCUs like the one I went to, the education, because the jobs of the future are in AI, they're in technology. Autonomous driving is gonna take away 6.7 million jobs in the US over the next decade. Many of those jobs are gonna be transformed into the energy um, and environmental space where energy technology and AI, such as autonomous driving, are gonna to begin to increase capacity, but take away jobs from so many in our community, which brings me to the second area of importance with the Public Service Commission, which is wireless broadband and high-speed internet. Um, Georgia, especially rural Georgia, lacks access. Uh, if you don't have access to high-speed internet, to first responder services, if our senior citizens don't have access to telemedicine or, or online prescriptions, if our children can't do their homework online, if our small businesses and our minority and women-owned businesses cannot, um, cannot go online for online transactions, we get left behind. Uh, there's currently a $20 billion FCC bill on, on utility scale infrastructure for wireless broadband. We need more of our minority-owned businesses to compete. We need more of our young kids that are creating games and technology and apps to be able to understand how to leverage uh, broadband and, and internet access um, with their work and with their ability to be entrepreneurs. But then we also have to look at the downside, which is the fact that 88% of Georgia's prison population reads at a third grade level. I said that, I'm gonna say it again, 88% 88% of Georgia's prison population reach at a third grade level. 
So we need to fundamentally understand that without technology, as the digital divide widens, as we see technology deserts around our state, we cannot allow our communities and our children to be left behind. Uh, Frederick Douglass has a quote that, that I stand on as a candidate and as a father of three black boys that says, it's better to, to build strong boys than to repair broken men. And we too often in our society have to repair our young men and repair our communities because we haven't made that investment up front. So I want you all to know that voting is of the utmost importance. Registering the vote is of the utmost importance. Being active in your community, not just politically, but socially is of the utmost importance. These conversations and examples of how you can strive to be an elected official, a doctor, a lawyer, a civic leader, a interfaith leader, there's so many areas. And I wanna be a representation of what that entry point looks like. For those of us on this call, I want us to all make sure that we remind ourselves of the importance of the village, the beloved community that we're all a part of and our role and our responsibility to each other, but more importantly, to our future. And I'll end with this. Um, I learned a very valuable lesson uh, from a very good friend of mine named Van Jones, who's a, a CNN contributor and also the founder of an organization called Green for All. Uh, there were several years ago, um, I was invited to a conference and it was about cl climate change and global warming. And I never learned about it. No one, you know, when I grew up with asthma as a kid, no one ever told me why. Uh, when I was in uh, the lower ninth ward of New Orleans, when I went to help families, no one told me that the, levee, the levees broke because of extreme weather and because of climate change. No one ever explained it to me. My challenge to all of us on the call is to not get comfortable in the spaces that we're familiar with, but to challenge ourselves to step out of the box. Many people wanted me to run for city council, Congress, um, you know, county commission, and I didn't want to run for anything that my heart wasn't in. There are not enough African Americans, especially African American men, in the energy sector. Uh, the the jobs, the opportunities, the the uh, the the value of positioning ourselves for the clean energy economy is immense. Imagine if we were to invest into Apple at an early stage, or Instagram, or Snapchat, or any of these platforms that are now worth billions of dollars. Well, the energy sector provides many of those same opportunities with solar and with other forms of renewable energy that the, the incoming Biden-Harris administration is going to be putting out. And here's the number I'm going to, I'm going to end with. $2 trillion is the amount of money. $2 trillion is the amount of money that the Biden-Harris administration has committed to fighting climate change, 40% of that money, almost the bill, almost $1 trillion, will be going to communities of color to fight the climate crisis and to stand in alignment with environmental justice. So my name is Daniel Blackman. I am on the ballot on January 5th in the runoff, and I look forward to learning from you, to being available, but also to building the kind of community that we can all be proud of, that we can pass on to our children and to their children. So thank you so much. I'll continue to listen, but I just wanted to be able to come on, chime in and offer my support. Great. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that in very informative presentation. Um, District four, um, wh where is, what area does District four cover as far as the Public Service Commission? And how does that, how does that work as far as um, you say, this is the second question. There is um, a trillion dollars that some portion of a trillion dollars is going to be coming into the black community. Where does this money go to specifically? When you say community? Uh, yes. Where specific, specify where the money, I mean, how that where that money goes, how is it uh, distributed, and where does it actually end up? So the first question, um, District 4 is in North Georgia. So North Georgia um, includes 27 counties. Uh, but this is a statewide election. So even, even though I, I am um, in representing District 4, I'm able to help set utility rates around the entire state of Georgia. The $2 trillion that's been allocated to fight climate change 
is going to be made available in various um, forms, such as agencies that exist, like the Department of Energy, the EPA, and um, the Department of Interior. The way in which we can align ourselves for it is with organizations and individuals that have a some kind of specified climate or environmental impact or purpose. <laughs> Let's just say, for instance, you have a community garden. Let's say you have a nonprofit, a 501c3, and you want to create community gardens and farmer markets in and around your community. You can then apply in various areas based on the amount that you're looking for, for those grants for those opportunity, but also for those investment. This is not just for nonprofits, it's for businesses that have an environmental focus. So what I'm telling you now is information that most people don't know. Within the first year of the Biden administration, I can actually foresee at least a half a billion of those dollars being spent um, throughout our communities. And we need to start thinking about what we wanna do with it, whether that is solar panel installation or you know anything, it's an opportunity for all of us to be able to align ourselves with jobs of the future and create opportunities with the money that's going to be spent. We have to make sure that we are educated about how to spend those, those monies so that when they come into our community, they're not, you know, communities from not, I mean, organizations from not in our community that are spending it on our behalf. We have to line up our businesses and our, um, and, and our churches to be able to be recipients and then redistribute that wealth throughout our community over the next four to six years. Well, let me turn the, uh, the, the presentation over to the students. Are there any questions for Mr. Blackman? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know that you're a very successful man and I wanted to know what's the best uh, career decision you think you've made in your career so far? I don't know if you heard him, Mr. Blackman. He said uh, he notices you're a very successful man and he wants to know what is the best career decision you've made thus far. The best career decision I made in my life was, uh, was making sure I understood how to make my own decision. I mean, I know that sounds rhetorical, but when you're young, you have a lot of people around you and you make decisions based on your circle. And the, the, the day, like when I left the music industry, um, and we, we can set up another call uh, personally because the, the, there's a, a long story behind why I actually left music. Um, but many of my friends that are very successful today, like DJ Drama and um, a lot of guys that I know, like Ludacris Manager, these guys were all good friends, but they were good people more than they were good friends. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because you don't want people around you that's gonna encourage you to make the wrong decisions. I, the hardest decision I had to make was my, was my best decision, which was making a decision on behalf of my family and my future and not making a decision based on what made people comfortable. Because a lot of times, like, I'm gonna say this to you right now, whoever asked that question, they're gonna come, there's gonna come a day where you can't call your mom or dad, can't call your friend, can't call your mentor, and you're gonna have to make a decision. And, and as black men, especially in this country, we have to know when to make decisions that some people may see as selfish, but you have, you're the only one that's gonna be available and around for all your successes and all your failures. I have failed at, at least four or five of my business ventures, but I've succeeded at, at at least 20 more. And don't be afraid to fail, number one. Number two, ch pick and choose who you are going to call your friends wisely. A friend is not somebody that you hang out with or that your social media, you know, they, they, they follow you on socials. Like the people that you surround yourself with. Now I'll share to you how Tyrese told me. He said, who's in your circle of five? And if you're, the, if you're the best person, the most advanced person, the smartest person, the wealthiest person in your circle, then that means you might need to change your circle because you don't wanna be the best person in your pack because other people around you may make you feel comfortable with mediocrity. And, I, and I, that's one thing I teach my boys every day. The minute you think average is okay is the minute that you off. Like the minute, you know, being an average kid, the minute you blend in with everybody and you don't stand out. And I don't say that in an arrogant way. I just have told my boys, like I've showed my, my son sons, here is the height of what success looks like. I've taken them all over the world. I've taken them all over the state. I've shown them stuff. And I understand that everybody is not in the same financial position I'm in. So I'm not just talking about trips to London and Europe and all that. I'm talking about trips to the North Georgia mountains to just be able to see what nature looks like. I tell my kids and teach my kids so much. So I would say to you, make decisions that are going to be transformative and not going to keep you on a level that you aspire to go further than. 
Excellent, excellent. Wow. Okay, well, you have shared a, a wealth of information and knowledge and wisdom. And um, I hope that all of our students uh, were fully engaged and, and ate up every word, just like I did. You're never too old to learn or, or, uh, or, or understand or profit from different perspectives. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Blackman. Keep up the, the good work and we're gonna keep in touch with you. Uh, I'm gonna follow up with you uh, as well on some other matters. But um, good luck with your campaign. And, um, and uh, we look forward to um, having you back sometime in the future. Thank you for having me. And I wish you all the best. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to have, have, have been able to speak to you all today. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. God bless. OK. Um, so now we um, are coming to a close. And I just want to give the students or anyone uh, a part of this program or, or not a part of the program a chance to uh, reflect and um, offer any um, thoughts on what you've learned or what you've profited or how you've profited from today's episode. Uh, and presentations. And so I'll just open up the uh, the floor to anyone who wants to make a comment that's a student or otherwise. Um, um, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Torrance, for allowing me to be on this call. And um, I've learned a lot from hearing from these um, successful and intelligent um, Black men. And it's just motivated me to just to try my hardest and um, be more, um, be, try to be as successful as them as I, as I continue. You, you, anybody else? I think it's been a um, a very informative session, um, and as always, typically, always, really, um, the information and our presenters exceeded my expectations, and as, and that's my prayer every time that the the broadcast exceeds my own always high expectations. So, so be encouraged, um, be excited, uh, no matter what's going on in the world and in our communities, there's always opportunity for those of you who dedicate yourselves to um, excellence. And uh, so uh, be encouraged, be excited. There's still a lot uh, of, of um, opportunities out there but you have to be prepared, prepare yourself. So. Um, I, I have a quick observation and comment, Dr. Thank Jones. you, thank you. No problem. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I appreciate the presence on the call and the speakers as well. I thought that they were dynamic, but most importantly, they knew the information. So my challenge to our students for our next get together is that you know the three branches of government is like let's do a quick quiz on that next time on what does the judicial branch represent the executive branch and the legislative legislative branch because those are essential and as we've seen throughout this specific time of COVID-19 that the government plays a very um, significant role on our lives they affect us every day and sometimes we don't even know who exactly is on the other end of that impact. So I think um, just a little information session, the next time we get together will be great. Because I think this is something that we all should continually work on. Even myself, I learned many things today about Georgia. I didn't know it was the number one place that um, brings in coal. And I also um, knew about the registration deadline, but I know how important this January 5th election date is to the history of America, not simply Georgia, but this is going to affect how everyone lives when you all are are 19 and 20 and 24 and plus. Like this moment that we're in now is forever. And it's like that all the time. And it, it can seem like it's a lot of pressure, but it's just about knowing and taking 
time to look it up, just like you would look up something on Instagram or Twitter. So, yeah, that was my take from today. Excellent, excellent. Rock Rogers, are you there? Yes. What were your impressions of the presentation today? What do you remember most? Name, give us something that you that stood out for you. Um. Well, um, when you say about like the um the the branches, like the this branch, like this um an executive branch, um. It's that stand out to me most because I did not know they had a specific role. Okay, okay, the different branches of government. You you remember what they are? I put you on the spot, didn't I? You got the judicial branch, the executive, and the um the le the legislative. Excellent, 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 excellent. What about um? Let's see. What about Evan Jones, are you there, Evan? Yeah, Evan. I'm here, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. Uh, what, what stood out about today's presentation? What do you remember most? Um, I What really stood out to me was especially the last presentation, um, learning history about Georgia as far mm. as, you know, Georgia being the number one place coal comes in and having um, some of the dirtiest rivers. Uh, mm. Because I never really, you know, thought about, um, thought about how that could impact us living here. Um, I've actually voted for the first time this year. I turned 18. So mm. it was a, a lot of good reinforcement about the importance of voting and the importance not only for me to vote, but for um, other young men like me to vote and just getting that message out there. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you for that uh, contribution. Uh, Nyan Ganey. Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing excellent, thank you for asking. Um, and as a wrap up, just give us what you remember most. What stood out uh, about today's presentation in your mind? Uh, they talk about the three branches and the um, civics. And I wanted to say that um, in my school, civics is making a comeback, I guess, and starting to come back. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so when you say making a comeback, are they offering it now or or has it been offered? It's just becoming more popular or what do you mean by making a comeback? Uh, it's been offered. Um, people are in the classes, you know, talking about it. More. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to take it or will you have an opportunity? I will have an opportunity to take it. Um, Okay, excellent. Well, you no, have head, to, you have an head, head start on the rest of the students. Yes, sir. Okay, you have some ad, ad, some uh, advanced knowledge, so uh, that's that's an advantage that you'll have. Very good, very good, very good. Well, uh, we are Marco. Marco, are you there? Where's Marco? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> there you are. Good afternoon, young man. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm putting you on the spot uh, along with uh, the other students that I've called on. Uh, it's just like being in class. You never know when... Uh, the professor's going to call on you, so you always have to be ready. What did you, what did you, uh, what do you remember most, or what stood out out of the three presenters that you heard today? Um, how Mr. Blackman, he was mm -hmm. saying how um, other counties, other parts of Georgia need more internet, and how like people could keep it more like, cleaner. 
mm -hmm. stuff like that. Is that uh, Mr. Mr. Council? Uh, yes, sir. How you doing? I'm doing well. And you? Uh, great. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, today I learned a lot. Um, but there was a couple of things that I took notes on that yes, I, I just want to share. It, it, it'll be real quick. And, and, okay. Um, some things that stuck out. Yes, sir. Uh, we can't complain about being underrepresented if we don't make that first step and go out and vote. So one of the responsibilities of vote, voting is making sure that you're informed. Don't just take the information that's coming across your cell phone and take it for face value. Find the places to go about research the issues and make sure you understand the issues that you're voting on. But I, I just want to hit on reading because I think this uh, kind of sums up a little bit what everyone said. It's the power of information. What can you do when you read? You can read to travel. What I mean by that, you can escape your neighborhood and see other parts of the world and increase your, uh, your mind. So you're not stuck in the neighborhood you're from. You can learn about different cultures. You can read to stay informed, stay informed about what's going on, what's important. Uh, read to learn about current and relevant topics. Uh, but most of all, read as a preparation for success and expand your mind. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think that's a good note to uh, wrap up this broadcast on, uh, Mr. Council. Um, I want to thank everybody for zooming in. I want to thank all of our guests, our students, and everybody who had anything to do with uh, contributing to this another successful broadcast. So as we uh, move uh, forward into the Christmas holidays, I want to wish everybody a Merry, Merry Christmas. It'll be um, a new year when we convene again. So we're already preparing um, what we hope will be uh, an exciting, uh, preferably, this is our plan, uh, an interactive uh, session and meeting in January. So everybody be safe, um, be put the things that you've learned into practice. And as always, uh, anything that you do, do it with excellence. So goodbye and, uh, and uh, take care to all, one and all. Thank you, thank you very much.